for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Have you um, read that book? Uh, I have not read the new one, Replacing Darwin. No, I have not read Replacing Darwin. <laughs> I, I forget the name of Jensen's book, but it's recent. Uh, but re Replacing Darwin? Yes. Yeah. Um, that 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 is such a pile. Famously, oh my god, it, it's 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 really a really a bad book. I haven't read the book. <laughs> it, it's 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 really a really a bad book. Guilty of not reading the book. <laughs> it, it's 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 really a really a bad book. I haven't read the book. It's, it's really a really a bad book. Guilty of not reading the book. When he talks to a scientific audience, he knows that what he says in the book is ridiculous and will be laughed at. In the whole thing with the um, with the mitochondrial Eve, um, time to most recent common ancestor that Jensen does, he like that is not intended for a scientific audience. Uh, I have not read the new one, replacing Darwin. No, I have not read replacing Darwin. He knows that what he says in the book is ridiculous and will be laughed at. Uh, I have not read the new one, Replacing Darwin. No, I have not read Replacing Darwin. He knows that what he says in the book is ridiculous and will be laughed at. <laughs> it comes down to the fact, because we know somatic mutations are not passed on. It's, it's that which is, is germ cell line. We can be confident, especially regarding everything you just said, with the corroborating data from all the multiple of independent data sets on mitochondrial DNA mutation rate studies that corroborate that this we do have a germ cell line mutation rate. And Dr. Jensen is so confident that he's making testable predictions that are coming true. He's having fantastic results in the Y chromosome, for example, with his history of civilization. He's detecting genetic signatures in the mitochondrial DNA. And this is what I find they never address. You know, they'll just say, oh, Dr. Jeans is lying. So I'm guessing that they just have to say this is coincidence. That is predictions and he, that are flowing from um, the mutation rate and, and his, his work and his research. It's just coincidence that it's working so well. I don't know, I've never actually seen them address it. They seem to just ignore it, especially the history of civilization. If these DNA differences really do reflect only 4,500 years, we should be able to detect signatures in the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, and we can. So I don't know, I, I still haven't seen a rebuttal to any of that from any of them, and, and they're free to, to write up uh, you know, a paper or an article on that, but just saying, oh, he's lying. Well, then you're just saying that his, his predictions are just coincidental. And, and lucky. I don't know. That that doesn't seem like a good argument to me. But yeah, that's what uh, Dr. Dan was saying in the chat. So I wanted to play devil's advocate there. So okay. I apologize. Matt, just to leave everything, you know, no stone unturned. Go ahead with what you were saying earlier, brother, and I, I won't interrupt. Oh, no problem. Um, I, I was going to say, let's jump into a study that he gave you during a live debate one time. I, I liked it. I was like, okay, let's jump over. Now there's something to talk about. Want me to do it? Yeah, brother. I'll, I'll leave it to you on that one. I'll be on mute for a second. Go ahead. Okay, hold on. I gotta jump over. Screen share. Don't know what I'm doing. I guess you can see my screen. Okay, so here's the study up here. I guess I can post it after this. The the it's called correcting or purifying selection, an improved human mitochondrial clock. Do you notice that? Even the title is biased, right? Because it says it's correcting purifying selection and it's improving the mitochondrial clock. What's wrong with it? Oh, that's right. It disproves it disproves evolution.
that's the problem with it. So basically, the study presumed that long time ago and far away, basically once upon a time, purifying selection was better than it was today and good enough to remove these non-selectable mutations from the coding regions of mtDNA. The study immediately shows its bias in stating that the observed linear clocks we see today are problematic. It says it right here. Why are they problematic? Because these are the actual observed rates right here, starting with how going all the way down, looking at substitution rates and mutation rates of the mitochondria itself. And then here we notice the next problem with the study. Ah, divergent time of human and chimpanzee. What a shocker. Like all typical evolutionary bias mutation rates, they immediately infer that there was a human split. Oh, so right here, essentially evolution to prove evolution. Add in those numbers and poof, you can prove evolution. Here, look, they even admit that they not only used archaeology for dating, but you can see on the line below it that they even assume uh, that the assumption it is based on the assumption. Notice that? Oh, look at that. What a shocker. Here we go again. I'll just leave that there. So I won't sc I'll stop scrolling for people who can read it. How is this not biased? It's not. You're now, the one rebuttal that Dr. Dan would have to this is... I guess once to leave no stone unturned like we've been doing. Okay. And I believe we are demonstrating that we can be confident with a germ cell line mutation rate and they have to calibrate. There's assumptions. But he'll say that paper involves testing against specific recorded historical events. Okay. Well, that means that that is in recent history. Recent history doesn't include a split from human and chimpanzee. Therefore, you need a mathematical model based on something to start with. And we'll get to that because this article says, and they admit, right. they, ha they need a starting point. And their starting point is right here. Right. Seven. It's right there. <laughs> right there. Yeah, there that's how I was going to respond too. So yeah, that's good. Keep going, brother. All right. Remember what we say. Anytime you see the word phylogenetic, it's made up trash. That's what we believe because it's assumption based. A model is built to prove its own model. And what do they say in the study? We constructed phylogenetic trees by using the reduced medium algorithm, basically phylogeny. So we use observed, predictable, testable mutation rates. That's it. How many predictions are in the study? Remember, Dan said that they're made, right? Okay, well, guess what? The word was found one time. Here, I'll prove it. Here's the study. Let's type in prediction, shall we? Oh, look at that, one time. Right, right. The, yeah, this was in response to, because I've had so many debates with Erica, with Dr. Stefan Frello, with, I mean, you name it, <clears throat> RJ Downard. And, and I've always asked, okay, fine. You know, uh, actually, most of them don't even really use the arguments of uh, substitution rates, somatic mutations. Typically, they're not up to date enough to use that arguments, but they'll just kind of say, oh, Dr. Jensen's wrong. And that's OK. Well, what kind of testable predictions can you make? And they'll admit that they can't because there's too many assumptions. There's too many inferences. There's too many factors. And I say, OK, well, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's making predictions on the history of civilization. He's making predictions on mutation rates in people groups in Africa, the Khoisan peoples where their mutation rate is not yet known. So Dr. Dan, he's the first whoever um, actually insinuated that, yeah, we've made predictions, we can make predictions. And, and this, this was the prediction. So just to give the background information, what are your thoughts? Is it really a prediction as, as we're, we're looking for there, uh, Brother Matt? No, no, they're using, first of all, this would be a retro diction. They're making a prediction about what the past was like. And it was a prediction by one person who you'll see soon is this guy right here. And he actually pr was trying to predict that uh, selection must be weeding out mutations in the past. So that's what they've done. They basically taken this guy's old prediction, which right. I think was 2005. And they said, oh, we're correcting it using his model of purifying selection to improve the human mitochondrial clock. <laughs> it's not a new prediction it's not on the future it's not like they can say well yeah it was different in the past and now it's the same but it'll change are, again and we're going to make a prediction on that are they making predictions at, at how effective natural selection and purifying selection has to be are they giving numbers are they giving it just sounds like it's a retro prediction it doesn't it's, it sounds like they have to assume population sizes they still have to assume some type of population history assume uh, natural selection is, is effective enough at, at weeding it out, like you said, purify. So I don't see any of those predictions there. I don't know. Do you? No, there's none in the study. Basically, what they've done is they've uh, not in this model, but here's what they do. They 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 take a number and then they believe like, okay, if we we need to line up this uh, this uh, 
human mutation rate with the phylogeny that uh, basically the fossil record. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a baseline. Well, Matt, I'm going to stop you right there just to play devil's advocate because this is a funny one. Uh, and, and we like you, Dr. Dan. Nice guy. We've enjoyed our discussions, but th this was kind of a weak, res weak response, but I'll pretend to be him. Here's his response to everything we're saying. Wait, I'm sorry. So you think selection doesn't exist or doesn't operate or something? How would uh, you respond? Well, yeah, of course it does, but it only selects the most deleterious and harmful mutations to get out. So it leaves the rest, and that's what we're counting to make mutation rate clock. We're leaving the, the amount that is unselectable and that is building up, and that's the mutation rate right. that Camorasol. Camorasol building up and selection couldn't remove it. And we go, oh, well, how many is there? Oh, there's about an average of about 100. Okay, well, let's do the math. How often does that build up? And that's why we say, okay, natural selection did it, you know, or they can look to substitution rates or, you know, they've got a number of explanations or some will say that, um, you know, time dependency, that it's slowed down in the past and then it's not quite as consistent as we think. Sure. Make the testable predictions that are future, not retro predictions like this. We agree natural selection works, but based on how fast the mitochondrial DNA is, Matt, we say this all the time. I said this to Guts a Given without like a real rebuttal. I said there's no mutation rate slow enough and there's no um, type of selection effective enough to account for deep time evolution regarding the mitochondrial DNA, regarding the, the Y chromosome. That's why... Testable predictions are so important. Nobody denies these things, but it's not going to help you. Even if there were a few, um, even if you gave them the benefit of the doubt with heteroplasmy and with somatic cell line mutations, it's, it's still not going to help. I mean, they need to invoke mutation rates 20 times faster than, than is observed. They need to invoke um, selection status much more effective than we see in the present. You know, they can come up with any ad hoc rescue device they want, but if there's no testable predictions that flow from it, then um, then it's pseudoscience. And they'll say, oh, you know, Dr. Jeanson's prediction, you know, where's his paper on the Khoisan people? Okay, let's get the plug, let's get the DNA, let, let's find out if it's true. But guess what? They never comment on the fascinating results found in the Y chromosome regarding the history of civilization. They never comment on the genetic signatures found in the mitochondrial DNA. I've mm. yet to see anything. I'm yet to see any response to that. And anytime I say, hey, look, you know, Dr. Jensen's incredibly detailed in his, it's got to be a 23 or 24 part series on the history of civilization, detecting these signatures using um, population sizes, population genetics, um, and other factors. But... The thing is, if these DNA differences, like we said before, only go back 4,500 years, then these, these historical events should hypothetically be detected. But if deep time evolution is true, okay, and humans evolved, you know, slowly over time from the Australopithecines, eventually Homo erectus, eventually Homo sapiens, and the out of Africa story is true, well, then the last 4,500 years is, is nothing, you got a needle that actually that 4,500 years is just the, the very little tip. It's so insignificant compared to the rest of evolutionary history. Therefore it should be nothing but a scrambled mess. You can't detect any signatures, but he is detecting signatures. So either he's lying or he's lucky. That's your only two options, you know, for them, but for us, no, the predictions are working because the model is accurate. And that's how you do science. So uh, go ahead, Matt. I just wanted to point that out. And it's, and it's not just working in humans. You've got to realize they've done pedigree studies on multiple animals, and they've never found a creature alive that was unable to say, like, wow, these mutation rates aren't building up. Maybe selection's more powerful in this creature or more powerful in that one. The mutation rate clocks all show the consistency. And that's what Jensen said. I'll challenge anybody. Let's go out, pick an animal, a fox, whatever, and make your prediction on it. I'll make mine. We'll see which one is true. Right. Right. You got it. Well, and, and I, and you know, typically we did this response video after I had a couple of discussions with, um, I mean, we probably talked at least with our two, uh, hangouts, Dr. Dan and I probably discussed mutation rates in Jansen for well over an hour. So we've touched on all this. So that's why, you know, I felt, okay, now's a decent time to, you know, cause I, I like to give them, the, you know, the chance to, to defend themselves, I guess, and, and provide their objection. So I said this to him a couple of times. I said, okay, 
you know, for one, if Gene Sin's uh, studies, you know, if, if there's so many glaring omissions, like he's saying, why are they working so well? That's one. I also said to him, since Dr. Jensen has gone through multiple other species mutation rates, and the answer is always the same across multiple independent data sets, data sets, then he is safe to assume we are looking at germline. And I went over like the yeast and the fruit fly and whatever, you know, I don't want to rehash everything. And, um, you know, his response was um, insufficient because they all corroborate on each other. That's the thing, you know, it's independent data sets that are corroborating on one key conclusion and boom, testable predictions are flowing from it. So um, yeah, uh, go ahead, Matt, continue brother. Okay. You know, we'll jump back into it before uh, I get too sidetracked. Cause every time you say something, I'm like, Oh yeah, we could talk about mutation rate saturation of mitochondria or something. And guess what? There's, it hasn't reached it. So why would that be true? If deep time evolution is true, there's a saturation limit that jumps right in there. Even um, rational mind was like, yeah, that, I guess that should have happened. And then he just moved on <laughs> anyway. Here we go. I said, uh, notice that nothing in the study was proven or even remotely verified. It was alluded to and considered likely at best. You can see the, their wording. Notice the language, most plausible, meaning without evidence. These people cannot read between the lines. They, they like you say, they hope, they dream, and they imagine, but that's what they do. Uh, here we go. No predictions were made at all in the study. Basically, they formulated a new way to manipulate mutation rates and to fix the timeline to their myth and then said it matched an older prediction of the past by Cavillicid, Kavil I can't pronounce it, in 2005. He's the one that's, that said he believed that deep because deep time was true, selection must have removed mutations in the past, but probably not today. Oh, what a surprise there. Who, who's heard that before? Therefore, the observed clocks can be undermined. See what he's doing? He It doesn't line up with evolution, and therefore it must be wrong. So there has to be some explanation for it. So they use this guy to invoke that. It's the typical ad hoc rescue device we often get. Here's the real question for them. That's what I posed earlier. Why all do all of these things show that? So the pathetic rescue device is that, well, maybe it was different in the past, which undermines the rest of their model, because if everything else is consistent in the past, then how could they say that this was different in the past? You can't use that as a rescuing device. Anyway, uh, what made them say it was likely that purifying selection removed near mutual mutations, which clocks are built off of? Even the study admits it. Look, what did they say? The virtual linear relationship between the accumulation of synonymous mutations and the control region mutations suggests that the control region cannot be greatly affected by purifying selection. So they say it can't be weeded out by purifying selection because it's not affected by it. Why is it not affected by it? Because it can't see it. It's that simple. Interesting, is it not that mutation accumulation is hardly affected at all by pur purifying selection? Just like this. Sorry, I wasn't here reading. So, um, I uh, I just write what I think sometimes, so I'm repeating myself because I'm just thinking out loud. So again, the exact opposite of what they are claiming in the very study to be true. This is why they invoke that maybe saturation of the control region for mutations must have happened in the past and then it got weeded out. But that way they can try to invoke that the mutation rate was again discounted entirely in favor of phylogeny rates, which they need to be true. But here's the problem. Deep down, they know that saturation cannot provide the major explanations for increase in the ratios of synonymous, synonymous mutations in the empty DNA trees or higher ages. So they invoke purifying selection as their rescuing device for that, which is why they mentioned, I really need to learn how to pronounce this guy's name, Kivislid, in the study. That is what they proposed must be the case. Basically, the gradual continuous removal of lineage lineages containing weakly deleterious mutations in other classes through purifying selection. So now you see, and everyone else can see, this is why they invoke purifying selection with the probability of the D-loop saturation. This is why the study in, is called the improved molecular clock, because they believe that there is, they have two rescue devices now that can prove phylogeny. So instead of one rescuing device, they linked two of them and then wrote a whole study on it. Isn't that real science? Anyway, the study admits because we do not know how far back in time the tree ceases to be effective under selection, these weak deleterious mutations will, will be 
a proportion of the overall diversity, despite becoming progressively more negligible, moving further back in the tree. So again, they add the human Neanderthal split as an assumption. Here they state it. And then they jump back to the human evolution ape split. So there you go again, evolution to prove evolution. How can they even, or uh, here they, you can see that they admit again, several assumptions are necessary. Wait, I thought you said that they didn't need a starting assumption to begin with. You absolutely do when you're gonna have a, a mutation rate. And now you can see with your very own eyes there, correct. They have removed the observational rate in exchange for a fantasy, a hypothetical human divergent of the past, a model built to prove a model, using evolution to prove evolution and all to obtain the results desired. They invented a population required to make a clockwork. It's called bootstrapping. And then that's what they've done here by correcting the observed overall. What do you mean correcting? It didn't need it. It's so good that the FBI are still using it. Anyway, here they have to say that the numbers would uh, be even better if, wait a minute, where's that if coming from? See, the study spends the majority of its time looking at branches of macro uh, haplogroups, the M, N, and R, which again, Neanderthal in date. Uh, so they're looking at these things to obtain a date so they can go off so they can make their time dependent clock. This way they can assume a mutation rate that they need to match their evolutionary tree. Look, assuming an overall intrinsic mutation rate of the past. Ah, assumption again. How can they honestly invoke purifying selection when the study even admits that purifying selection doesn't even act on it? That's what confuses me. Take away the evolutionary assumption the entire study wouldn't even exist. This entire thing is garbage without evolution ex already existing as their base study. It is filled with nothing but estimates and guesses and hypotheticals and assumptions. If you type control F and look up the word estimate, it is used 122 times. Look at it. Well, that's the wrong one. What the heck? Look at that. Insane estimate. Anyway, so they, they, they're stating, how many times is assumption used? Look at this. And remember, this is the best one they got, apparently. <laughs> yeah, this is, the best, this is what debunks this. Here's, this is what kills that creation right here, this study, the assumption model. You will notice that in the study, they need a calibration point to even make a mutation rate possible. You notice that? How is that? So do you see? They need to admit that there is a starting point for their model to even work, which is a pure assumption model to proof of evotarsin. Take away that and you have the observed rates. Add in the assumptions and you get studies like this, evolution proving evolution. Anything can be done when you use a theory to prove its own theory. What is this? Uh, look, if it doesn't say at all, I don't know. Implications of the finding of the mutation rate is approximately consistent with lower ages in that some of the issues that have arisen concerning deep time dependency of the control region of molecular clocks are likely caused by problematic data sets by suggested by an evolutionist. What a shocker. <laughs> so the evidence doesn't line up to evolution. So therefore it's problematic and wrong. Nice. Uh, so that's wrong because it is correct. It's in correcting data to interpret is what's going on. It's summed up with damn cannot see because he doesn't want to believe it. And when we go right here, we see when the recalibration of the M the clock by accounting for the effects of deep time. What? Deep time? Oh, you don't account for deep time? You don't make the clock? What a shocker again. Man, the study really admitting a lot about itself, isn't it? The very thing he is setting the study does not do, the very study says it does do. And it says it makes assumptions over and over again. He says that it makes predictions. It does not. He says it solves the riddles of mutations for building up. It does not. It gives rescue devices but the study in no way does anything more than answer the riddle of what Kondershoff has been after the entire time, invoking assumptions. The study even admits that removing mutation rates, they found that were too fast in particular, right here, I guess I could read it. We, can, we excluded mutation rates at this position because the mutation rates at this side were so disproportionately fast in comparison to the rest of the mutation rate. So when they, Here's my prediction. Here's what I say. So even when they found the mutation rate was fast in this region, they discounted it and ignored it. Why? I promise you that if that region was slow, they would have immediately counted it as evidence. This again shows you the bias that these people are under and how blindly they want to look at it. So the study is ripe with biased evolutionary assumptions and it stands out like a sore thumb. How can any honest person that's open-minded look and read these things and have another and know that there's another perspective like ours and then recognize that it 
that, oh man, like, okay, well, I know that there's another view I can look at, but I'm not going to look at it at all because all I see is evolution is true. So the motives behind Dan are that evolution is true. It seems like either he's so indoctrinated that he can't see it and he only sees through the lens of evolution and he can't comprehend that we, our model is actually what it's trying to say, but he's like Erica and Aaron Ra. That's what I think. I think that he doesn't even want to see it. I think that he can't even see it because if no, he can't. This well, because he's using the same arguments in the chat that he's used before that we've already responded to. So, and and well, yeah, keep, keep going, yeah, keep going, brother. No, no, that's I, that's all I'm saying is like literally, if he can say, stand back and and see that we state this and that it must be not true because of this when we've explained it multiple times. Right. I don't get it. I, I just don't. I mean, how many times does a study say assumption? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and where's the future novel prediction that we were asking for? I, I, I don't see it. I see assu no. assumptions, conjecture, storyboard, as Brother Neff always points out, storyboard. And, and Neff, great paper, the Y chromosome. 70% dissimilar between chimps and humans and evolved through gene loss. Devolving equals evolving. So <laughs> Brother Neff was pointing that out in the chat. He's so right. Nice. Well, I just wanted to show you guys because literally that everything was amazing. told you in that debate is wrong. Everything. Everything he said the study said, it doesn't say. So in the story, I'm done. Well, yeah, that was an amazing, amazing um, write-up to that paper, incredibly detailed. Anybody interested in it, we'll, we'll send it to them. This is proof, okay, because after how many debates with some of their so-called best, you know, asking them, hearing every rescue device in the book and asking them, what testable prediction can you make? And they admit they can't. And now Dr. Dan comes with this. So obviously he's seen those debates and thought, oh, okay, I'll show them up. Gives this prediction. I, I um, you know, I, I stated, I predict that that paper is not what you say it was. And there you go. Another confirmed testable prediction by a creationist because it wasn't. I, I forget uh, the name of Jensen's book, but it's recent. Uh, but re replacing Darwin. Yes. Yeah. Um, that, that, that is such a pile. Famously, oh my God. It, it's, it's, it's really a, really a bad book. I haven't read the book. <laughs> it, it's 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 really a really a bad book. Guilty of not reading the book. <laughs> it, it's 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 really a really a bad book. I haven't read the book. It's, it's really a really a bad book. Guilty of not reading the book. When he talks to a scientific audience, he knows that what he says in the book is ridiculous and will be laughed at. In the whole thing with the um, with the mitochondrial Eve, um, time to most recent common ancestor that Jensen yeah. does, he yeah. like that is not intended for a scientific audience. Uh, I have not read the new one, replacing Darwin. No, I have not read replacing Darwin. He knows that what he says in the book is ridiculous and will be laughed at. Uh, I have not read the new one, Replacing Darwin. No, I have not read Replacing Darwin. He knows that what he says in the book is ridiculous and will be laughed at. <laughs>